Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our devotional for this week. Today, we are studying the book of Ephesians chapter 4. So we're going to go through this verse by verse and break down overall what the Bible has to say here. So this is really cool. This is a great chapter. If you ever want to know, how should I be living as a Christian or as a believer? This is a great chapter to refer back to just to get uh, an understanding of the characteristics of how God is calling us to live. And so let's start with verse 1. It says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. I love how Paul opens up this chapter here. I'm a prisoner for serving the Lord. I have no other option. There's no other life for me. I'm not, I don't clock in and clock out of this. I don't, I, I can't quit on the job. This is who I am. And this is who I'm called to be. It says, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you, you and I, the church, believers, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. Okay, so this opening verse really sets up the whole chapter because this whole chapter, what we're going to learn is how God has, first of all, called us. To, uh, he's given us the mission. He's given us an assignment. And Paul is pleading with us. He's begging us. I beg you, understand this call that's on your life. Know truly who you are. You are called by God. You are sent and commissioned by God himself, the creator of the universe, and, and, and in doing this, this opening scripture is telling us when you truly know who you were called to be, it's going to change your perspective on how you're supposed to live. So in this chapter, we're going to get that. Let's unpackage what it looks like to live according to the call that God has given our life. Okay? So we're going to break this down in four sections. The first section, I'm going to title it. I'm going to give it its own title, verses 2 through 6. We are one. We are one. This is unity in the body. So let's go from verses 2 through 6. It says, always be humble and gentle. Okay, so first off, first thing off the bat, this is the way we live worthy of the call that God has given us. How do I live worthy of the call? First thing I got to do is I have to remain united. I have to, um, and, and, and this, is, this is how we remain united. This is how we can do that. We always be humble and gentle. Okay, what does it mean to be humble? Well, don't be arrogant. <laughs> don't be prideful. Another way to put it is think of others as better than yourself. Don't always try and put yourself above others and one-up somebody. The next word says always be gentle. What does it mean to be gentle? Well, it's not being pushy or, or looking to, to have, always have it your way. When someone who's gentle, they're, they're okay with not always having it their way. They're okay with not pushing their own authority around or pushing their weight around. That's not gentleness. And so the Bible is saying here, how do we live worthy of the call? Be humble and gentle. Think of others as better. Find ways to serve others and serve the needs of others. Don't make it always about yourself. Then it says, be patient with each other. Okay, this is big. Uh, another version of this uh or another translation, instead of patient, it says long-suffering. And that word long-suffering means the ability. It, it, some, of, some people have described it this way. The ability to take revenge, but you don't. <laughs> How crazy is that? The ability to take. And here's the thing. You never need patience with, with an angel. You don't need patience towards someone who's perfect. You only need patience towards someone who's being difficult with you. So that's why the Bible says, if you're going to live worthy of the call, that God has on your life, you're going to have to learn to be patient and to be long-suffering and to not fight back against someone that's difficult with you. Be loving towards them. Be gentle. Be humble towards them. And then it goes on to say this, verse 2, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. This is a big one. What does it mean to make allowance? Well, let's just put it this way. It's inevitable that people are going to be people. What does that mean? We all have faults. We fail. People will let you down. Um, your, your family, they're capable of letting you down. Your friends, they're capable of letting you down. Even your pastors and your leaders, myself, we're capable of letting people down. But there's only one who is not. 
Jesus will never let you down. But this is why God is calling us to make an allowance. It's almost like, have you ever budgeted, set a budget aside for something in the future? Some people set a budget for a future purchase they want to make. Or they set a budget aside for just a savings, just for a rainy day, just in case we have to fix uh, something in the car or you know, a leak in the house. We have a budget set aside. In the same way you have a budget set aside in your finances, have a budget set aside when somebody makes a mistake towards you or they fail you. In other words, it's saying, I'm not going to allow any future faults that someone has towards me. I'm not going to let that hinder my relationship. So I'm going to budget. I'm going to set aside some grace and some mercy towards that person ahead of time just in case this happens because the chances of someone letting you down are 100%. People are going to let us down. It's just the way life is. So the Bible's saying here, make an allowance. Decide ahead of time that you're going to give grace so it doesn't hinder your unity and ultimately it doesn't cause you to live unworthy of the call that God has in your life. Does that make sense? So make an allowance. Make some, t- make some space for people to not be perfect because ultimately, here's the truth. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. So thank God that people have made an allowance for us. Let's do the same for others. And then it keeps going and it says, verse three, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Make every effort. Other translations say endeavor. That word endeavor, it says to endeavor. And endeavor means trying hard, working very hard. It's it's an action word, trying very hard to achieve something. In other words, the scripture is saying, work very hard, do your very best, do whatever it takes to maintain the unity in the spirit, remaining united in the spirit. So we should not give up being united with our brothers and sisters. Don't give up so easily. Let's just say there's conflict or there's tension between you and another brother or sister in the Lord. Well, don't give up so easily on it. I just don't really talk to them. I'm just going to stay out of their way. I'm just, I'm just not going to build. Maybe we're just not called to have a, a, you know, a good relationship. That's not true. According to the scripture here, the Bible says you have to make every effort. You have to work hard to maintain unity with your brother or sister. So don't let your relationships in the Lord fall off so easily. That's the plan of the enemy. The enemy wants you to give up easily in your unity with somebody else. Don't let that happen. Make every effort. Stay united. Okay? And then it says this. Binding yourselves together with peace. Binding yourselves together with peace. So what does that mean? It's like staying united it means, that it, it, it means that you have this bond of peace. In other words, it's staying together, not just by um, loving one another. Yes, you love one another, but you also, you're, you're united by being peaceful. So there should be, you should not have outbursts of anger with one another. And if you have, and if that's happened, there's mercy and grace to cover that. But we stay, we, we, we have this bond together in peace where we avoid saying outbursts of anger. We avoid using harsh words towards one another. We avoid slandering each other. We avoid hurting each other. We avoid fighting and bickering. Let's let's have this bond of peace. Not this bond of tension, not this bond of fighting, but a bond of peace. Okay, then the scripture goes on to say, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called together to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. We are united because we all share these things together. We all share one body. We're the body of Christ. We all share one spirit. That's the same Holy Spirit lives in all of us. We all share one glorious hope of salvation. We're heading to the same future, and Jesus is our hope. We all serve one Lord who is Jesus Christ. We all have one faith. We don't believe differently. We believe the same, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We all have one baptism. What does that show? That we all have died to our old sinful nature in baptism, and we all have been reborn and remade new. And we all have one God and Father. What does that show? That we're all adopted as His children. We were once orphans, and now we are children of God. 
And he is over all of us. He has power and authority over all of us. He is in us. When we, when we allow Jesus to make uh, um, our heart his home. And not only that, he's living through us as the Holy Spirit lives in you and empowers you. So God is saying here, the scripture is telling us here, we're not different in that we have different faiths and different beliefs and a different body and a different spirit and some have greater and there's different tiers and you have a, 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 a big Holy Spirit and you and someone else gets a, a junior Holy Spirit. It's not, that's not that. We all come from the same sinful nature. We've been reborn and been made new because of Jesus and we all live for the same God and have the same faith. So let's stay united in that, knowing we come from the same dirt and we have been redeemed because of the same blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for that. Now let's keep moving forward. So we know that we're supposed to live worthy of the call, but now let's look at verses 7 through 12. This is a second section, and I title this, We Are Gifted. We Are Gifted. So let's look at this. This says, verse 7, However, However, he's basically making the distinction here, although we are the same in a lot of ways, he's saying, however, he has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. So yes, we are the same and we are united as one, but we have different giftings and different functions. The same way our bodies are one, our, 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 our body, because this finger is on this left hand, it doesn't mean that it's not a part of me. It's still my body. If I squeeze it, I could feel it. This is, this is my body. And this, does, this isn't more of my body than this side of my body. It's one body. But, but in the same way we're one body, different part, body parts have different functions. I use my eyes to see. I, I use my nose to smell. I use my hands to hold things. Uh, there's different functions for different parts of the body, but we are the same. In the same way, it's for all of us. We have different giftings. We've been called to different uh, uh, um, functions and roles, but we come from the same body for the same purpose and the same goal. So uh, it goes on to say, that is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Jesus is above all. And he decided to fill the universe with himself. It was Jesus that has decided and, and we are the body of Christ. And Jesus has determined that Maybe your gift is different than someone else's and then their gift is different than theirs. But it was because of Jesus that we have been given these gifts. So now we can spread this good news about Jesus all throughout the world. We being the hands and feet of Christ can make, fill the world, fill the universe with the love of Jesus Christ. And he uses us to do that. So let's go on. This is going to be good. Verse 11, verses 11 through 12, it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Let's pause there really quick. What is the church? What is a church? The church is the body of Christ or believers everywhere. So it doesn't just mean the wayworld outreach or, uh, or another church that's, that's uh, uh, any local church in this area or all over the world. It's not just the, or, it's not the organization. The church is all believers everywhere everywhere all over the world we are the church together as one i have brothers and sisters i've never met that live in another country but they we all we belong to the same body we are one body we're the church so it says uh, jesus i'm sorry these are the gifts christ gave to the church here they are the apostles the prophets the evangelists and the pastors and teachers so their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So these are the gifts that God, uh, Jesus gave to the church, the apostles. I won't break them down too much in detail, but an apostle is, is like a special ambassador of God's work. They're pioneering and they're breaking through and they're an ambassador going places that maybe no one else has gone. A prophet, a prophet speaks the word of God. It's always in congruence. It's always consistent with the Word of God and, and sometimes speaks 
into someone's life to encourage them and even speaks uh, a, a, an inspiration, a word from the Holy Spirit for someone to encourage them and to uh, uh, edify them. Evangelists. Evangelists are specialists in preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world to see souls get saved. Pastors. A pastor cares for the flock. A pastor, and another, another way to describe a pastor is a shepherd. They care for the flock. They tend to the flock. They feed the flock. And a teacher. Teachers teach. Obviously, they train with the Word of God. They're specialists, and they understand, and they care so much about the Word of God and teaching others the Word. And the purpose of all of these roles, this is big, is not to do everything. This isn't everything. This, this, this five roles here, that's not everything. Their job is to equip the body or equip believers, equip the church to do the work of the ministry. So, in other words, the pastor's job, the prophet's job, the apostle's job is to do whatever it takes to build you up, to build you, to mature you, to disciple you, to train you, to encourage you, to send you out, and to teach you, the church, so that you can do the work of the ministry, so that you can love others, so that you can serve, so that you can spread the gospel. The church should not be a a spectator group watching just a pastor or an evangelist do everything. And, and, then, and then a believer cheers from the side. No, the way it should be is the, the pastors and the teachers and the apostles are like the coach on the sideline, training, building, uh, building you up. But seeing you as a believer in the game, winning, fighting, saving souls, meeting needs, loving people, defeating the works of the enemy. That's the way God has called us to do. And so God has gifted you, the church. He's gifted you. He's given you these gifts, the church. He's giving you these gifts of the prophet, the apostle, the evangelist, the pastors and teachers, so that you can be equipped and trained up to do the work of the ministry. Praise God. All right, now let's keep going. Next section, section three, we must grow. Verses 13 through 16, it says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. In other words, We're not going to stop growing until we fully mature and measure up to the full standard. Uh, We're going to continue. We're going to continue until we've all come to this unity. And the reality is that in this lifetime, we never hit the full, complete standard, which that just tells me as long as I'm alive, I have room to grow. Amen. I believe that for me. I have, I believe I have room to grow and I believe you do too. If we're honest, we can both say, yeah, I got room to grow. And then it says, um, then it says, verse 14, then we will no longer be immature like children. What does it mean to be immature like a child? Well, let's see what this context of the scripture is saying. It says, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. So in other words, when we're not, when I'm immature like a child, uh, I believe anything I hear. I, I fall for traps. I believe lies. I, 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 I just, I, I fall for things. It's, it's, it's sometimes easy to trick a child. That's why a, a, a child uh, will believe anything. They'll, they'll hear anything and believe it. I remember when I was younger, um, someone told me that um, I, I didn't understand that the world was a giant globe, but someone said, did you know that China is right underneath us? And I thought, I literally thought right underneath. So I remember in kindergarten, I, I got a group of friends and we, we started a project. We went to the sandbox and we started this initiative and this project. We're going to dig a hole and we're going to get to China. Because <laughs> I believe China was right under us. So we got our shovels and we we're out there every recess in kindergarten. We were in recess, and I was leading a project with our friends, and our friends, and my little friends were asking me, hey, Christian, are we almost there yet? And I'm sitting there like, yeah, we're almost there, guys. Let's keep digging. We're going to get to China. We all know that's crazy because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of miles um, between us and China. (laughs) But I believed. I just believed things. I was a child. I believed anything I heard. But But the point is this. We must grow beyond that point, that immaturity as a child, where we're we are mature enough to know what the truth is. 
And the only way we can be mature enough to know the truth is when we're spending time with the truth, who is Jesus Christ. And He's given us His truth through His Word, through the Word of God, the living Word of God, who is Jesus. When we open up that Word and spend time with Him, we grow, we mature, we learn what the truth is so that we won't fall and, 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 stop to be, and start believing lies and the, the, these deceiving things the enemy tells us. So we can't be tricked into believing things. We understand the truth and we stand firm on the promises and the truth of God. So, and then it goes on to say, verse 15, Instead, we will speak truth, the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, perfectly, as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So we must speak and grow in love. We must lovingly uh, seek God's truth and teach others God's truth in love. We must grow to be more like Jesus. And we must continue to do our special work that God has given us and help the body grow, which means help your brothers and sisters to grow in the Lord and mature and grow. Amen. Now, it's the last section here. It's going to be the longest section, but we're going to go through this the quickest. Verses 17 through 32. It says, with the Lord's authority, I say this. This means this is big. This is a command from God. It says, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for, th- for they are he- uh, hopelessly confused. In other words, don't live like the world. They are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. So, what does this mean? Well, the Scripture's telling us very clear. Don't live like the world. And here are some ways we can identify if we've lived like the world. If we have any of these things in our lives, then maybe we've patterned our lives after the world and we got to we gotta come back from that and we, we have to acknowledge it, repent of it, and live more like Christ. And here are some of those things. The world is confused. The world believes in false gods, false superstitions, false things. The world's confused. The world is full of darkness. The world wanders from the life God gives them. They don't, they, don't, they don't seek God's plan for their life. They wander away. They harden their hearts from God. They don't want anything to do with the Lord. They have no shame in the evil things they do. They live, they live for themselves, for their own lustful pleasures, and they're eager. They're eager to practice immorality. They're eager to practice their impurity. So those are evidences. But it says in verse 23, it says, Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So the Spirit of God gives us something different. He gives us new thoughts. He gives us new attitudes. He gives us a new nature. He gives us righteousness and He gives us holiness. So when we're walking with the Spirit of God, we walk truly holy, truly righteous, with new thoughts, new attitudes. So we have to shift our perspective completely and our and, and how God uh, speaks to us. We got to renew the way we think. We got to change our attitudes. Sometimes we got stinky attitudes, and we need to, we need to change our attitude and allow God to work through us and give us a new nature. All right. And then the, what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go through these last few scriptures, but I'm gonna share a, what not to do, and then I'm gonna share what to do. Okay. The scripture tells us in verse 25. It says, "So stop telling lies." Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you're a thief, a thief, quit stealing. <laughs> I love how straightforward the scripture is. Just if you if you're a thief, stop. <laughs> it says instead, use your hands for uh, good hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. 
Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. <laughs> Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So here are the don'ts that this portion of scripture tells us not to do. And I just listed them out. And this will actually be a good practice for you. List them out. Do not tell lies. Scripture says, do not let anger control you. Do not steal. Do not use foul language, which is cussing, abusive language, speaking dirty, speaking harshly about others. Um, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by your lifestyle. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way you live. Don't be bitter. Someone does something to offend you. Don't stay bitter in your heart. Let it go. Don't be full of rage. Don't be full of anger. Don't speak harsh words. In other words, don't speak so aggressively towards someone. Be gentle and kind in your words. Remember that your words hold the power of life and death. So speak highly, speak gently. Even if you're correcting or loving somebody, don't do it harshly. Speak in love. Of course, in power and authority, with conviction, but not harshly to the point you're trying to hurt somebody rather than help them. Do not slander, which is speaking negatively about people, even behind their back. Oh, did you see so-and-so? Did you hear about this? Stop slandering people and do not behave uh, full of evil. Okay, what are the do's from this portion of Scripture? I listed those out too, and maybe I missed one or two. I, I encourage you, go through it and, and see for yourself. Do tell the truth. Be honest in everything, even the little. Do work hard. So what does that mean? Be a hard worker. Like, do whatever you can to work hard. Don't be lazy in what we do. Work hard. Give generously. Don't hold back when someone is in need. But when you see a need, give generously and be, be eager to help somebody. Do say good and helpful things. Have you ever heard um, that old saying, if you got nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all? Well, this scripture is saying, find something good and helpful to say. In situations where maybe it gets tense or there's, or, or, or we need to work towards a solution, find something good and helpful to say. Don't just beat people up with your words. Be helpful. Be uplifting. Find solutions. And then this next point, be encouraging to one another. Be an encouragement. I want to ask you this. When people come across your path and they speak to you for any period of time, do they leave feeling encouraged or do they leave feeling discouraged? Do they leave feeling uplifted and ready for their day? Maybe their perspective was wrong, but you help them to see it through. Or do they feel leaving beat up? <laughs> Let, let's, let's be encouraging to one another. Be kind, do be kind, the scripture says. Do be tenderhearted, which is like showing compassion for people. And this last one here, do be forgiving for each other. And remember, this scripture is not just generally speaking. This scripture is speaking to the church. So in the church too, be forgiving. In other words, believers should be forgiving towards other believers. Find grace and mercy for other brothers and sisters that are around you. Just as Christ Jesus forgave you, we should be loving and forgiving towards one another. Well, I know this was a doozy. This was a good chapter, but we went verse by verse and we covered as much as we can. This week, I believe you're going to be blessed in Ephesians chapter 4. Dive in, get your pens out, get your, get your highlighters ready, and get ready to hear from God every day as we spend time in Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to hear from the Holy Spirit because He has a word for you. Spend time with Him as we mature, as we grow closer to God, as we stay united, and as we serve God and live worthy, lead a life worthy of the calling that God has on your life. God bless you. I pray that this bless you today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. God bless.